I remember when I was, uh, when my girls were about six and eight, I thought, uh, since my father was a hardened fisherman, somehow those genes didn't get passed on to me. I, I don't have the patience. I'd rather go water skiing on a nice smooth lake than sit there waiting for a fish to bite. But I thought my girls deserved uh, uh, a go in fishing. So I looked online and got some used fishing poles and a box of lures and whatever, and we went to uh, Peter Lougheed Provincial Park, which is just... Uh, not too far out of uh, Calgary and we camped and as all good fishermen do I got up real early with the girls do you think Mern went with us <laughs> you got it right no she said you take the girls I'm gonna have a good sleep in devotional time that'll be wonderful so we got up I don't know about five in the morning and we went that's when the fish bite don't they anyway we went and uh I had the bait and I had everything and just thought we're going to have a great morning. They're going to catch some fish and not even a bite. Not a bite. So that was pretty discouraging. But I mean, that's sort of a lead in to our, uh, our topic tonight, isn't it? Ern? Uh, the church in uncharted waters, why the fish don't bite like they used to. You know, um, that was a real example, of course, we're going to learn how to be fishers of men and how the Lord wants to use us, even in uncharted waters. So I have a lot of respect for our uh, secretary to the president, Ern Brake, he's with us, he's a great communicator and uh, presenter, thus LMK has sponsored to bring him in to instruct us. And just for your information, we're going to uh, bring him in back in the fall to do another weekend seminar. This is sort of training for us as members so that we can make friends for Jesus, so we can be successful at fishing, being fishers of men, and, uh, and then hopefully apply the skills we've learned here so that when he comes back in the fall to do something more for the community, that we'll have made friends for Jesus and can invite them to those presentations. But Earn Brake grew up in a Canadian Air Force family, in, and he lived in France, Germany, and Atlantic Canada. He was converted from postmodern atheism in 1980 at the age of 20 while attending university in Halifax, Nova Scotia. His first contact with the Seventh-day Adventist Church was in response to an It Is Written telecast while in the seeking mode. Praise God for It Is Written and all the souls that it has touched. And any kind of outreach that we do, don't discount it. Souls are being reached, right? After... Uh, after resigning his position at Via Rails Canada for Sabbath reasons, he wanted to honor the Sabbath and his employer uh, wasn't uh, uh, inclined to, to go along with that idea, right? He took probably a blessing because then that forced him to reevaluate the direction of his life and he decided to go to CUC. Canadian Union College, now Berman University, and he, he took theology there, and he came away from Berman University with a theology degree and a wife. Yeah, amen, you hit the jackpot, a double, a double header there. I got the wife, but I didn't get the degree from uh, CUC when I was there. There were some extenuating circumstances, nothing bad, just... I want to make that clear, because a lot of people have sometimes have difficulties at school in aligning with the rules. That was not mine. I, got, I was there long enough to meet Myrn, and that was a wonderful thing. Together with their son, Michael, they, they have served in the Newfoundland Conference, Earn as a pastor, and June as wife as a school principal from the mid-80s to 1997, during which time Earn received a Master's of Divinity degree from Andrews University in Michigan. He then served as pastor in the British Columbia Conference in 2010, at which time Earn moved to the conference office to serve as ministerial director and then assistant to the president for REACH, uh, promoting and educating and training about the benefits of the REACH uh, planning model. And then he's now currently serving as vice president for administration or the executive secretary to the president as well as other ministries, such as health ministries and probably half a dozen more that 
you didn't mention, right? Earn has a Doctor of Ministry degree focusing on how the Adventist Church can authentically engage secular postmodern seekers and has developed several seminars that incorporate the information that he studied out and can be a benefit to us in the way that we reach out to people around us and effective in our communities. So we're so glad you're here with us. We're so glad you're part of our administrative team, Earn, and let's just bow our heads and we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for a beautiful day we've enjoyed. We thank you. We're anticipating the Sabbath hours, and we know that you have a special blessing. You've set that side, you've blessed that time and set it aside for a special purpose. And we look forward to that. I pray that you empower Earn as he presents to us. May we have clear minds, may we understand. May we be able to be uh, encouraged and uh, inspired to apply some of the things that he shares with us so that we can be effective fishermen for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, Ern. That's so you see, anyway, at that time. Uh, as you know, um, and maybe you don't, I don't know, I did a little bit of research on the Kelowna area, and it looks like a, a metro Kelowna, including West Bank and every, everything in between, you are approaching 200,000 souls uh, in, this, in this broad area, 200,000 souls. And if the statistics hold true for the Okanagan Valley, as they do for British Columbia, uh, a 45% of them are unchurched and declare no religion as their religion. Uh, this is a, the fastest growing, quote, religion in Canada and in British Columbia, no religion. People say, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic, I do not affiliate with any any denomination, no institution. Now sometimes, however, it does mean they believe in some kind of God out there, it's just more nebulous, et cetera, et cetera. But, so we kind of have our, our job cut out for us. After all, Jesus did say in Matthew 20, 28, and verse 19 and 20, to go and make disciples of all nations. And a disciple is someone who follows Jesus. And we can look up the 200 words, occurrences in the New Testament, that word disciple, find out what is a disciple. Now, in the end, we are challenged with the fish that are out there. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about fish. But first of all, let's take a look at the screen and take a look at a few things to see how all this kind of pans out. Um, now, is it possible? I was going to say, is it possible to get these lights off? And before I even said that, they just came off. So it's a magical place around here. Um, this is back in about 1994, give or take. Uh, that's me and my wife there in the top uh, left-hand corner. And this is a group of um, kids, pathfinders, at Woody Acres Camp Meeting uh, in Newfoundland, uh, where I used to pastor. Uh, my job was to take care of the junior age division. And I did that for about eight years or so. And this is one of the groups that I took care of. We had started off with nine meetings a day. Uh, and it went down to seven meetings a day, starting in the morning, went right to the campfire at nighttime. So we had them all day long, doing all kinds of things, games and Bible and every, you name it, we did it all with them. Now, I had this really innovative idea because parents told me that their children were, were becoming, Adventist children, were becoming secularized, were becoming, quote, tainted with the world, and what could they do? Uh, and this is back in the 90s, and I thought to myself, you know, they're watching TV, they're watching movies, there's no YouTube, nothing like that back then, no internet, but television was a big deal, uh, and radio, and uh, so Hollywood had a big influence on our, on our kids at that time, and still does. So I thought what I would do, uh, I couldn't just say, hey kids, don't watch TV, bad for you. I, to say that would, would to accomplish zero. So what I wanted to do is teach the children to discern 
when they watch this stuff so they can know when to turn it on, turn it off, or be able to at least analyze what they're watching. So that was my approach. And so back at that time, uh, I bought an old TV, a big screen TV. Now, do you know what a big screen TV looked like in the middle 90s? A big hunkin' box, that's what it looked like, and it weighed 75 pounds, I weighed it. And I'd carry that everywhere I went to go, go present these new media types of things. And then we, we spent $700 for a VCR. The VCRs were becoming more popular, and we spent, and it was only for the purpose of putting in like health videos and doing seminars and everything else. So we had a VCR, we connected it to that TV, and then I hired somebody to record from television uh, uh, about 10 seconds to 30 seconds worth of TV programs and commercials. And so I got all that, paid the money out of my own pocket. I now had it on the VHS video, which I, uh, yeah, on the DVD, play, not DVD, V8, uh, what, uh, v VCR. It was a VCR, put in your VHS video and you can play. So the idea was I'd be playing these snippets right after I teach the children about you know, ethics, what Jesus would do, how to uh, modify this and that, how to um, assess what is good and what is bad, what the Bible says, what Hollywood says. So the idea was to help them learn to discern. As a matter of fact, there was actually a program called Learn to Discern. And so that was my idea. And people thought that was very creative. It never had uh, been done before. And so that's what I did. And I did that with these kids. These are the kids. They are now grown up and married and have their own children right, right now, which tells me how old I am uh, as I take a look at this. Uh, so I know I'll, I still have relationships with some of those kids even today. So the interesting thing is that I learned when doing that for two years in a row, two summer camps, two, two, two camp meetings in a row, I was inundated with something that I had never known before, and that was called postmodernism. Postmodernism is now the description of the thinking of today's generation. Uh, people say, well, is, if you're younger, you're postmodern. If you're old, you're not postmodern. Not some, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about what postmodernism is and try to define as best I can. But the younger you are, the, most post, the more postmodern you are. The older you are, the less postmodern you are. And the more religious you are, the less postmodern you are. Now, you put those facts together in Kelowna, in Winfield, in West Bank, in Rutland, wherever you are in the, in the Okanagan Valley, you're almost guaranteed to run into, for one, for every two people, one of them will have this postmodern kind of mindset, probably at least one, probably more, as we go around. And this describes the people who God says, I want you to go and reach them, because they're hurting. They're lost and they feel it. They, they're, they're afraid of institutional oppression, et cetera, and all kinds of stuff like that. And it was this group of kids that I learned that in the 90s. And so I figured I needed to study this and see what I can do. Now, I'm going to get back to that group of kids in a moment. Right now, I have shown this, what I'm about to show you a number of times. How many of you have seen this, you recognize me showing this somewhere before? I'm so, only, only a couple of people. That's great. That means it's going to be new for most of you. Jesus says that I want you to take that guy, see if I can make the, yeah, see, that guy, and turn him into that guy. And it says that in Matthew 28, verse 19. That's what I want you to do. I want you to make disciples of all nations. In Greek, panta ta ethna, all ethnic groups in the world, all 1,600 of them. And so imagine then that that guy right there is what you could say a minus 10, a minus 9. He's so far away from God. He's an atheist. He's indifferent. He's agnostic. He's uh, antagonistic to God, to Christianity, to church. That's where he is. And now, this fellow here, Jesus says, I want you to bring him to a minus 7, minus 6, minus 3, minus 1. I want you to bring him to me to be converted. And then once he's converted, and that's what the cross represents, he meets Jesus. 
he gives his life to Jesus. Then at a plus one, two, and three, he's a growing Christian. He's a baby Christian, actually. And then uh, four, five, and six, he's a growing Christian. And seven, eight, nine, and ten, he's an influential kind of leader type of Christian. And so I know this is overly simplistic, but it gives the idea of, of, of growth, of growth from a minus ten to a plus ten. There's all kinds of things we can throw in there that would complicate it, and life is complicated and it's more real. But just for the sake of illustration, let's just go with this. And so... What he's going to do in his uh, pathway to God is he's going to go through stages. He's going to go from not believing in the supernatural to believing in the supernatural. Tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about that in my own uh, uh, belief from that to that. Uh, Then he's going to go from believing that there's a God out there and that that God is a Christian God. And then he's going to believe that the Christian God inspired the Bible to be written. So it's going to become a believer that the Bible is inspired by God. And that's going to lead him to some other things. And then finally he's going to give his life to the Lord. And then, maybe not all in that order, and then he's going to grow uh, as a Christian. So think about that as we go through this. Now, all of those yellow boxes represents the stages that he goes through. And I guarantee you there's people you know who are going through one stage or another. You can probably think of your friends, relatives, neighbors, workmates, who are in various stages of of growth toward God or with God. Now the interesting thing here is that while he's going through that, we as a church are helping him as best we can to help him go through that. And so... He's the yellow, but we are the colored blocks. And so community outreach and community evangelism is what we do that kind of connects us to him. And then after outreach, we do evangelism, and I'm just defining outreach as anything you do to build up somebody. You paint their fence, you help help somebody across the street, whatever it is you do. But evangelism is a little bit more uh, intentionally pointing them toward Bible truth. Because painting a fence isn't teaching anybody about the Bible, but it is illustrating, you know, a a Christian, being kind to your neighbor. So we have a a progression here, and then once they're converted, at some point or another they join the church, and then the church ideally uh, develops them in their discipleship. They become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, and if I could possibly put all that in order under the reach, R-E-A-C-H, the reach core values. The revival is the R of reach. We help to bring revival to the soul who's been dead and now he's revived. Uh, the E stands for education. So the church is there to educate people about God. The um, A is for alignment. That has to do with teamwork. People working together is great. Uh, a perfect example is people in this very room who are from the various uh, Adventist churches around the area. I don't know how many of you there are. I see there's at least uh, maybe three, at least three, maybe more churches represented right here tonight. And praise the Lord for alignment to go along. Uh, the C in REACH stands for community, as in community outreach and evangelism. And the H stands for healthy leadership, not just leadership, but healthy leadership. The difference between leadership and healthy leadership is Unhealthy leadership is uh, someone trying to get power for himself. Uh, Healthy leadership is someone empowering others. So we want healthy leadership. So this is kind of like the whole um, big picture. This is the big picture of where we're going. Now the fact is there are more and more people in the Kelowna area who are minus sevens, eights, nines, and tens than ever before. If you call them fish, there's there's fewer minus twos and minus threes types of things. So let's just take a look. Back in 2005 at the General Conference, which took place where? Yeah, it happened to be St. Louis at that time. That kind of gives it away, I I was hoping. Uh, The uh, final of the five study centers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was established. And here are the study centers. Uh, Two of them have amalgamated since. Jewish studies, Islamic studies, Buddhist studies, Hindu studies, and secular postmodern studies. 
So you can go on the internet and you can see this uh, on our own uh, Adventist websites. You can see this right here. And so I'm dealing with more what comes out of that particular study uh, center. Now, imagine the Adventist church is an island in a sea of fish. And the, the island is Adventism and the sea of fish is the Metro Kelowna with almost 200,000 fish. And half of the fish are postmodern fish. Now, uh, we had Doug Batchelor come to camp meeting there about four or five years ago, and he spoke to the pastors uh, only uh, one morning, and he talked about fishing, just kind of like what Cameron did. He talked about fishing and how different fish need different bait. And it was very interesting the way that he talked. Um, it kind of reminds me of what I had here in my screen. If you look very closely, you see, well, simplifying it, there's two kinds of fish, the yellow fish and the blue fish. Now, this is what life was like a few decades ago. We had lots of blue fish, and the yellow fish were the postmodern fish. But over the last, say, 30 years, especially since the 80s and 90s, watch the screen uh, very closely. Did you notice anything? <laughs> Did you notice the change at all? Uh, first of all, it looks kind of murky and weird. It doesn't look pretty at all. And that's to represent the fact that Jesus said, when I come back to the earth, will I find faith on the earth? There will be darkness, spiritual darkness. So God has called us to be lights in the middle of darkness. Um, secondly, the island got smaller. And thirdly, what happened to the fish? The fish, the, the yellow ones, the, there's more yellow ones now, and there's fewer blue ones. Now, the blue fish, you could call them modern fish. The yellow fish are postmodern fish. Um, there are more of them. So that means in the bait that we used to try to catch regular old fish back in the 60s and 70s, that bait still works, but less often. It just simply is the truth. It works, but for fewer and fewer people. Why? Because there's more and more yellow fish out there. Methods, the message hasn't changed. Truth hasn't changed. Three angels' messages hasn't changed. But the target audience has changed. What do we do about that? So that's kind of what we're kind of trying to deal with right here. So that we can have the joy of bringing joy to somebody else. As, as they are working through uh, the, the challenges of life. They don't believe in God, or they're not sure if there is a God out there at all. Uh, but, but, but we can do something. We can help them along the way, step by step. If they're minus 10, the least we can do is bring them to a minus 9, and minus 8, et cetera, et cetera. And so now, let's just talk a little bit about postmoderns and what we mean by that. About a third of the world's population is postmodern, especially in the uh, you know, Europe, North America, basically any place that's either urban and influenced by media is going to be postmodern, okay? Uh, if I could simplify what postmodernism is, which really can't be done, but I'm going to give you an oversimplification of it, according to the philosopher Michael Foucault, and that is, postmodernism is incredulity toward meta-narratives. Now, is that all clear now? We're, we're good? <laughs> all right, let's explain that a little bit. Okay, incredulity, what does that mean? It means I don't believe it. Credible means it's believable. Incredible in the literalistic way means it's not believable. So incredulity means oh, I can't believe that. Okay, incredulity. Okay, incredulity toward, okay, what's a meta narrative? It's a paradigm, it's a worldview, it's, uh, it's, when we say the Adventist church, we believe in the great controversy between good and evil, that's a, meta, that's a meta narrative. It's a worldview. When someone says, I believe that uh, evolution, you know, we started off in the, my, you know, the, my, op, my uh, soup, that, that soup thing, miasma, uh, in a, evolution, it's, it's a meta narrative. In other words, it's a worldview. So it's a, a way of saying, here is what the truth is. And we as Seventh-day Adventist uh, people, we deal in truth. We want to teach 
truth as it is in the Bible. And so a, a postmodern will say, I don't believe in truth. And if there is a truth, you cannot know it. That's the postmodern talking. And I'm going to share a little bit more, but you'll know you're in a postmodern world when, and then I'll kind of share, I'll fill in the blanks a little bit more, and they'll kind of help us a, a little bit more. You will recognize this in your children and grandchildren. You, you will say, ah, now I know where they're coming from. And so let's just see what we can do here. First of all, let's take a look at um, the comic strip in the newspaper, which I sometimes call the philosophy page or social commentary. Uh, this is a uh, comic strip called Zitz. It's the dialogue between a modern dad and a postmodern son. Are you ready? The postmodern son, who's 15 years old, says, You expect me to pay a $400 cell phone bill? That's a lot to put on a 15-year-old, I must admit. But dad responds, Who incurred the charges? Me. Who promised to be responsible for any overcharges? Me. Who assured me this would never happen again? Me. Dad continues, so then, who should pay the bill? Son, I'm not sure I follow your logic. <laughs> there you go, an illustration of modern and postmodern. Now, I'm guessing that most of us, if we are Adventists, we are, and especially if we're older, like over, over 50, for example, uh, chances are we're more influenced by modernism than postmodernism. But this is an example because we just pull our hair out listening to the so-called logic of a 15-year-old or of a 25-year-old even or even of a 35-year-old uh, who is not a, a church person. So, but we have to figure out what's going on. Now, we can read in the spirit of prophecy these words. The lessons that a child learns during the first seven years of life have more to do with forming his character than all that it learns in the future years. First, this is from the book Child Guidance. So I believe that's inspired by God. Amen. First seven years of life, foundationally important to the mindset and, and the, the, the growth potential of a child, the first seven years. Which means then that your first seven years of life wherever you are, wherever you grew up, whatever atmosphere or environment you grew up in would be a big determiner on your worldview. Is that logical? Okay. Uh, there are other institutions who will say the same thing. The Catholic Church says you give us your child for seven years and we'll have it for life. That's what they have said. Uh, so there is some psychological, scientific, and inspirational truth to that statement about the first seven years. Now, where were you born? In what era did you grow up in? As we try to figure out the mindset of us. Now, I'm going to oversimplify and overgeneralize. There's always exceptions all the time. But just for fun, let's just figure out something. The builder generation was born between 1920 and 1945. They're called the builder generation because they built the institutions which the rest of us uh, take advantage of and use. They are the, the greatest generation, if you want to listen to Tom Brokaw, who wrote the book, The Greatest Generation. Uh, so, was it Tom Brokaw? Oh, never mind. Uh, now, the boomer generation, the baby boomers, were born between 1946 and 1964. You've probably heard of this before. All right, uh, men come back for more, mostly men, and, and for 1945 and six uh, and nine months later, guess what? Babies started getting born all over the place, all right? And truly, the, the numbers just kept on rising. And that started in 1946, and it ended in 1964 when the babies being born became less and less and less, hence the baby busters, all right? So baby boom and a baby bust. And so 1965, if you're born in 1965, until 1985, you're called a baby buster, uh, and sometimes called the Gen Xers. You heard of the Gen X generation. Now, if you're born in 1985 to 2004, called the Bridgers or the Millennials, 
Now, depending on which demographic author you listen to, sometimes we'll say that the, the millennials actually started to be born in 1981. So it just depends on where you're going. But generally speaking, this we can put this there. Call, sometimes called the Gen Y. Uh, so where were you born? Or when were you born? Because when you were born uh, has an effect on your mindset. And now the, the classical uh, illustration of the effect on mindset of when you were born are those who were born during or grew up during the depression and the war years versus the baby boomers who grew up in the 50s and 60s. There's a huge difference because if you grew up during the depression and war years, uh, and if, I don't know if too many of you are, are, very many of you are here, but you were taught to delay gratification. You're taught to save for later because you don't know if the food that you now have is going to be available for later. So there's a scarcity mentality. But not so in the 50s and 60s. If you happen to grow up in those years, then there is this plenty mentality. The prices of houses are going to get higher. Your wages are going to get higher. More and more things are being built just for us all built by the builder generation, by the way. Schools are getting bigger and more institutions, et cetera, et cetera. Different mentality altogether. You can imagine why in the 60s they had something called the generation gap uh, because it's a total different mindset. That has a factor, not completely, and less so in the Adventist church, but in the world for sure, that has a factor in how people think just when they grew up and where they grew up. Uh, so each of these generations is motivated by a different uh, MO, modus operandi. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question that guides the thinking, and again, I'm overgeneralizing, but for the sake of uh, getting through a presentation quickly without too much detail. The builder generation, for them to be motivated to do what they do, all they need to know the answer to is, is it truth? If I know what the truth is, I know what my duty is. Ellen White says the voice of duty is the, is, is the voice of God. Okay? This is very understandable to the builder generation. It makes sense. Okay? Tell me the truth. Convince me of the truth. And that's, that's all I need to be motivated. Okay? When I share that story, and when I come back to that story of the kids, the junior kids, I want to share a little bit more about that. The boomer generation don't, don't care as much whether it's truth or not. They want to know whether it's fulfilling. Is it fulfilling? Is it meaningful? If it's true, that's good. But if it's true and not fulfilling, then it's not good. It's not motivating. Uh, for baby boomers. Again, I'm overgeneralizing. Uh, the busters, the Gen Xers, are saying, is it fun? They're the latchkey kids, so they're the ones who grew up with their parents, uh, boomer parents basically going everywhere and leaving them all by themselves. They're the ones that grew up with many, uh, their parents got divorces, and they're kind of bringing themselves up on their own and feeling kind of lonely and lost. Uh, again, overgeneralizing. So they want to make up for that by having fun. The uh, Bridgers, or the millennials, want to know, is it experiential? Even if it's not fun, like watching a horror movie, uh, thrill rides, drugs, uh, it just give me something that makes me feel alive. And then that'll, be motiv that'll motivate me enough to do what you're asking me to do. Now, the three, the, the, the four generations here, and we know there's another one coming up now as well. If they're motivated by different things, then should that not impact how we uh, teach the Bible? Now, the Bible is true. We believe the Bible is true. And if you don't believe the Bible is true, then welcome here. You're in the right place. Um, but Jesus had a very interesting way of teaching truth. Did you ever notice, say John chapter 16, for example, it says there, I have truth to tell you, but I'm not going to tell you because you're not ready yet. And if we want to follow the model of Jesus, 
we not only need to know the truth, we need to know whether the audience is ready yet to hear particular truths. Uh, and Ellen White's commentary on that is, she said, Jesus had, I don't know if she used the word plethora, like many, many truths before him that he could have said, but he held back all these ones and he told that one. Why? Because that was what they needed to help advance in their growth. So we need to be responsible not only to know what the Bible truth is, but to know where they are, where the fish are, type of thing, okay? Does that make sense? Now, I'd like to know what you've heard about postmoderns, if you've heard about postmoderns at all. And here's a time for you to raise your hand and say, yeah, here's what I know about postmoderns, okay? So I'll give you a chance. What have you heard about postmoderns? Tell me. Yes, please. Entitled. <laughs> that word comes up either in the title or the first or two or second line of every article on, on postmoderns or millennials, the entitlement thing. I was watching a, 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 a millennial doing a TED Talk on millennials, and her TED Talk was entitled, Why We Hate Millennials. And it was because we're entitled. And it's interesting because she came onto the stage and she looked at her audience. She said, oh, just a minute. Hi, everybody. <laughs> That's what she did. Anyway, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Evolution, yes, evolution is just assumed, all right? If you don't believe in evolution, it means you're dumb, uh, according to many. So thank you. Pardon? There is no God. And there is no God. Now, a lot of postmoderns believe there's some kind of nebulous God. A lot said there is no God. Um, some people will say, I'm going to go through the different eras of, of philosophical thinking in a moment. Uh, and postmodernism is kind of what we're in now. Some people say, well, is there anything after postmodernism? And it might be fundamentalism or, ex or uh, a polarization of extremism. You know, some being there is no God. Some there's, there's many gods and all kinds of gods. Anyway, anybody else? You could say there's deism today. Yeah, deism. Yeah, that God made the world and ran away type of thing. He doesn't answer prayers. He doesn't involve himself in your life. But he made the world. So, yeah, that's deism. Uh, there's that as well. Yeah. Let me go on and tell a little bit more. We can figure this out. Um, anybody recognize that house? Anybody a carpenter would ever build a house like that? that <laughs> yeah, he said, you had to be inebriated to build a house like that. Um, yeah, it looks kind of screwy, doesn't it? Uh, it's actually a real house. It happens to be in Poland. Somebody actually built a house like that. It looks like the camera's kind of screwy. But no, it looks like... But that is what we see when we look at postmodernism. There's something wrong with you people. There's something screwy about you. Your, your lines don't match or something, right? This is how it is. And so, uh, here's the same house at nighttime, by the way. I, I saw that on the internet. So, oh, wow, that's so cool. Uh, so, I'm going to give you about uh, maybe 10 slides starting with that sentence. You know you're in a postmodern world when. Are you ready? After many hours of preparation, making sure that you quote the scriptures and not your own opinion, and they say, so what? Has that ever happened to you before? It's happened to me. I worked so hard. I made sure it was logical. Follow step by step by step. And it almost seemed like they were believing it. But they said, so what? You know, that's postmodernism. Or they say, that's just your interpretation. All right? You got your truth. I got my truth. So don't bug me with your truth. I got my own. All right? That's what they would say. Or someone says that. Oh, I just said that. <laughs> that may be truth for you, but not truth for me. Or uh, you point out the inconsistencies of your students' beliefs. Or I was talking to teachers when I wrote that. And she says, whatever. All right, notice the W with her hands there. Whatever, all right? Uh, whatever. You know, this is like a postmodern kind of a thing, a millennial Gen Xer type of thing. Um, you know you're in a postmodern world when Miley Cyrus carries more authority than Mother Teresa. <coughs> because they're all celebrities. And all celebrities are equally celebrities. 
whether you're Mother Teresa or Miley Cyrus or whoever is the latest person today. Uh, a movie is appraised more for its special effects than for its moral teaching. I read a book called Hollywood vs. America uh, by Michael Medved, a movie critic. And uh, he talked about a friend of his, and he's, he was a Hollywood kind of guy, and he talked about a friend of his, saying, oh, this is a really cool movie, you got to come. And, and so he brought his wife. And it was a horrible movie. It was blood all over the place. It was immoral, unethical, and it was just a tor- terrible movie. And so Michael Medved said, why did you invite me to this? He said, it was a good movie. Oh, special effects are so good. Look how they do all the blood and everything, all explosions and fires and stuff like that. It's almost like ethics and morality doesn't matter anymore. It's just the, the externals that matter. And this is postmodernism, and this is what the world is that we're, we're living in. Your child loves confusion in the media. It's not clear MTV would be an example of that. Um, your baby boomer's first word is not goo goo. <laughs> it's not mama or dad, it's Google. All right? Babies these days are born with an iPhone in their hand, they're texting from the womb. That's why, they know, that, that's why they know how to press all the buttons on your old VCR where that 12 o'clock is slashing all the time. Okay? They, they know how to do that at, at the age of two years old. All right? they, they know how to text it, from the womb. It's amazing what they can do. Uh, you call your son on the cell phone to tell him supper is ready, and he texts you back from his bedroom saying, what's for supper? You know, you're in a postmodern world when you see more curved lines than straight lines. And people value feelings over truth. And truth does not motivate. Builders asking what is truth. Boomers asking what is fulfilling. Busters, Gen Xers asking what is fun. And the bridgers, bridging over the millennium, over the year 2000. Bridgers or millennials asking, is it experiential? Okay? So, therefore, when truth doesn't motivate someone, you know you're in a postmodern world. Now, I need to finish off my little story here with my junior class, who were in the 1990s, already about 12 years old or so. Um, so, I showed them these uh, video clips. I show them a 10 second video clip of Homer Simpson and Bart Simpson. I showed them a video clip of a commercial. Uh, I showed them a video clip of like a McDonald's hamburger thing and so we talked about the health message as well. I show them all these things and I read what the Bible says. Uh, for example, the uh, Homer Simpson clip I showed them was Bart Simpson uh, insulting his teacher in the classroom. So I said, um, what do you think of that? I just read about respecting your parents and respecting your elders. And then I show that. And so in a sense, it's given an inoculation. And they actually got it. They said, yeah, that's not good. That's not right. We wouldn't do it. You know. So I said, praise the Lord. We're, we're, we're enabling the children to discern something, to be alert to how they can behave like Jesus. But it didn't work everywhere. As a matter of fact, it, it rarely worked. I got to some place, and I forget where it was, and I said, now, would, would Jesus do that? And the whole class, they said, no, as if they, you know, practiced together, saying it in unison. No. I said, would Jesus want you to do that? And they said, no. I said, would you do that? And as if they practiced, they said, yes. So I was successful in teaching the truth. I was successful in inculcating a, a, the set of standards that were biblical in the minds of these children. Because they, they knew what Jesus would do. They knew what Jesus would want them to do. They just didn't want to do it. And this, when I, when I first encountered this, I, I was frustrated. I didn't know what else to do as a pastor except to teach truth. What am I missing? 
There's, there's, there's something going, uh, what's, what Kool-Aid are they drinking? What water are they drinking? There's something in the air. There's something different about the generation that I was learning about in the, in the 1990s. And so I had to study this out. And it's led to where, you know, postmodernism and everything else today. I did that for two uh, camp meetings in a row. At Woody Acres Camp Meeting in Newfoundland. And it's the same results. They can know the truth. They can understand the truth. They can see it logically. They're just not motivated to do it. So there's something we're missing on. Can anybody guess what it is? We're going to talk about that because that's what we've got to talk about. That's experiencing Jesus, knowing Jesus. There's something powerful in a relationship with Jesus. You see, the, the, the commentary is, and it's not correct, but it's one of those comic strip things. Baby boomers would love to have a discussion on the love of Jesus. The baby busters and millennials would love to love Jesus. Discussing it and living it are two different things. All right? We're great at discussing things, but what about living things? And, and so we now have a younger generation that looks at the older generation getting divorces, for example, and saying, I don't want to get married because you older people, you don't make it look fun. You know, and, and it's like we, they look at the older generation and they say, why would you want us to copy you? You don't look very happy. We got to do our own thing. Um, in 2008, what happened in 2008? It was, the, it, was a, it was the Great Recession, right? It was a stock market crash that rivaled almost the Great Depression of the 30s. Uh, and so when young people were coming out of school in 2008 and going into the workforce, what were they met with? Complete rejection. Complete um, an analysis that the people who run the institutions are uncouth and unfair and, and they're selfish and they're hypocrites. And you want us to join you? This is, this is what they're saying. Uh, and so we therefore have to find ways to, to help these young people. And it's not just young people, really, there's, of all ages. There's more of them are young people, that's all. Uh, to find a way to know Jesus. We've got to find a way. But not have to force them to go through institutions first to know Jesus. There needs to be a little switch on that. I'm going to share a little bit on that tomorrow. Um, this is a big one. It's funny. This is a big one. You know you're in a postmodern world when Daddy asked little Billy to fix his computer. You know why? Because Daddy doesn't know as much as little Billy knows about the computer, which is very fascinating because for the last six millennia, children always knew less than their parents. They depended on their parents for advice, for life. But not so much today because they have Google. They don't need mom and dad as much. This is creating quite a phenomenon of the younger generation not feeling the need of an older generation. However, the good news is that when studies are done, uh, we find out they want to have attention from their parents. But they act like they don't want to. And it's creating confusion in the parents. Just read about that just earlier this week. Uh, first of all, any thoughts or questions on that before I go ahead? Thoughts? Because remember, in October, we're going to try and target some of these people. Some of them are your neighbors and your relatives. What can we do, step by step? Any thoughts, questions, doubts, hesitations, or confusions? <laughs> yes, please. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, it's Google. It's YouTube is the second biggest search engine. Um, Amazon is the biggest search engine for, for money, you know, with people with credit cards. And so we have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Google. And we have people live. Oh, my iPhone's over there. People live on their smartphones. As a matter of fact, we must, we must find a way. If Jesus says go 
and make disciples, we must go to where those potential disciples are and they're on their iPhones, their cell phones, whether they're the Samsungs or whatever they are. Got to find a way. By the way, the North American Division sees this as well. And so I was talking to Gordon Pfeiffer. Some of you may know him, former president of the BC Conference. I just talked to him a few weeks ago. And there's a department at the North American Division on like digital media. Evangelism, like digital evangelism. Having digital missionaries. We need to be looking into this. Uh, using the, the media as an entry point to the next steps. Like media would be minus 10, uh, like Facebook or something, and they see something on Facebook, it leads them to the next thing, the next thing, and leads them to you, and then you lead them to the, the next thing, and next thing, and then church, and Jesus. I mean, we have to see a pathway from where they are to where God wants them to be. And that pathway these days is going to begin on multimedia, on, on Facebook, on Google, on Amazon, on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, you know, LinkedIn. Uh, we need to become familiar with where lost people live and then go there and then invite them to the next step. We need this. Uh, here's a website you can go to, uh, SDA Data. S-D-A-D-A-T-A, -A -A, sdadata.com. And you'll get some very fascinating information on how to bridge um, missionary work with digital, uh, digital work. So just for your knowledge. Um, anybody else? Yes, please. Whenever you're with young people today, yeah. they're on their iPhone. Yes, they are. No, <laughs> they're having their own conversations on their iPhones. They don't need you, right? They got their own thing going on. And again, I'm generalizing. They're not all, all, all that way, but a lot are. Yes, please. Um, this is where the adults are having to ask the children to help yeah. Is it a downfall of the adults for not keeping up? I wouldn't blame the adults because things are changing so fast. It really is pretty hard. I mean, it would be an adult who can keep up, I would, I would give them a medal for, for, for keeping up. But the fact is, things are changing so fast and so rapid that we can't be blamed for it. But if we become knowledgeable that, it's, that that reality is there, then we can act on it. You see, we can act on it. And as you may know, it's the Seventh-day Adventist Church that has been first and foremost in media ministry for the last 90 years starting with like Voice of Prophecy, right, on the radio. I mean, it was the Seventh-day Adventist Church that started using media for evangelism. And so let's just continue doing that for, for the cause of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. There are things we can do. Um, and so here's another one from the uh, philosophy page, Hagar. So Hagar and his friend are sitting down and they're having orange juice. And one says, why can't people in different countries with different beliefs all live together peacefully? Well, when I'm reading that, oh, wow, well, this is interesting. This, this is going to be a commentary on, on society. So Hagar has an answer. Because they refuse to listen to what's good for them. All right. Who would tell them what's good for them? Me. That's a postmodern commentary on modernism. Because everyone knows what's right for me. And they don't care about what I think. They just want to tell me what is right. And that feels like oppression. And there's a resistance against that. Uh, so that to me, I'd like to know who the, uh, the comic strip writer is to find out how old he is and see what his connections are. I'm guessing he's a postmodern. Uh, now, in building on that comic strip... Imagine that these, uh, I don't know, what do you call them? Diagrams, little pictures. They're actually copies. There's four copies of the very same thing. Let's just call that truth. Okay, let's call it truth. A paradigm, a worldview of truth. Now, a postmodern person, and probably a lot of us here today, would say, we really don't fully you know, have a full understanding of the truth. Let me just back that up and uh, 
some would say uh, the same truth is looked at based upon your experiences. Same Bible text is read and interpreted slightly differently based upon how uh, your life, it, which is you know, good and bad, I suppose. But a postmodern person, and, and indeed many people today, would say, you have your truth, I have my truth, and they're saying it because we are so finite in our understanding of all the knowledge that there ever was that we can't possibly have uh, um, all the truth. Therefore, what truth we do have has got to be colored by our own biases. This is, this is the, 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 the philosophy of, of today. So, when someone says, aha, not me, I have the real truth, I see this. As soon as we say, I have the truth, and I see the truth the way it really is, we have immediately lost credibility. Because it means to a postmodern person, you don't really see your own biases. Which means that you are blind. So if you act like you see, and you don't really see, that means you don't have much credibility to me. Why would I want to listen to you? Hence, television evangelists. Why would I want to listen to people preaching on TV, telling you what the truth is, when they're not admitting their own biases? Now, I'm not saying this is all good, because we do believe as Adventists what the truth is. I'm not, I'm not debating that. What I am debating is that the perception of our target audience is affected by our attitude toward the truth. It's affected by that. Therefore, simply be aware of that when we're sharing. That's all I'm saying. Just be aware of that. Because when we uh, say, you need to listen to me, because the Bible says this, this, and this, and we therefore lose credibility, and I'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow, we're actually doing the opposite of evangelism. It's, it's evangelizing for Satan driving people further and further away from the truth. Now, I did a dissertation on this at Andrews University. Skip Bell was the one leading out. Russell Burl was one of my counselors. Uh, some of you may know these, some of these people. And what's required in a doctoral dissertation at Andrews University is a, a summary of all the literature on the subject. So I had to do a chapter on that. But before you do that chapter, you have to provide a theology of, and then fill in the blank, whatever your subject is. So I had to do a theology of reaching postmoderns. How do Seventh-day Adventists reach people who think so radically different from them? How do we do it? So where do you find theology? The Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So I have a whole chapter on that. So I read Desire of Ages. I read Evangelism. I read Gospel Workers. I read Testimonies to Ministers. Uh, the book Evangelism I read three times through. And then a fourth time I read everything underlined, which was on something on almost every page. And I went through and I looked for words that Ellen White used that could be for like postmodern. Of course, that wasn't a word back then. So words like skeptic, words like worldlings, words like unbelievers. Okay? And then what did she say that would help us understand how to reach them, how to influence them, how to bless them? So I went through these four books, underlining what I saw, and a, and a number of things emerged. On this. I'm, writing a, I'm going to be writing a book. I've got to retire soon so I can write all these books. Uh, but I'm going to write a book on that. What Ellen White and the Bible say about this. Because there are steps you take. And that caused me to think of the minus 10 of the plus 10. Also, the, uh, Charles Ingalls uh, wrote something on that in the 70s. And Mark Finley introduced this to the Adventist Church in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, you probably would have seen it if you ever watched the old DVD uh, and, and VHS videos called Making Friends for God by Mark Finley. He would have introduced this sort of thing, that somebody going one step to the next. Well, I found that in Ellen White. I found that she said, before you do this, do this. 
and never do this unless you do this first. And I thought, no wonder we're failing in reaching the world for Jesus. We are not following what Ellen White has said on these things. And there's just so many quotes that she talks about as, uh, here's one, I'm just going off the top. Of I have another whole lecture on this and I didn't bring it, I mean, to my computer, but I, I don't plan to, to speak on it today. Unless you force me to have a Saturday night party and then I will do that then. Um, she says something like, let them know that you're Christians and that you love their souls and you care for them. And then she said, there'll be time enough for doctrine. She says this. So that means something comes before doctrine, right? So step one, step two. Well, she says more things like that, and then you can start saying this, before this, before this, before this. And so I began to see what was needed and, and why uh, we're, we are not as successful as we want to be in reaching people for Jesus. And so if you want, I can find a way and give that to you, if you like. I have about, I don't know, 80 quotes from Ellen White and all, all that stuff. Um, it's just fascinating to see that we had it all along. As a matter of fact, here's a story. Uh, came from Andrews University Seminary. And um, I told it once to our ministerial director, Tom Glatz. He says, yeah, I know that's true because I know the guy. Um, there was an, an, a seminary student who, I don't know, in the 90s maybe, 2000 somewhere. He um, was studying church growth. And he said, where is the biggest Christian church in the world, and how did they grow so fast? I want to know. Does anyone know, by the way? It's in Seoul, Korea. It's got a membership of around 700,000 people. They have about eight church services on Sunday, and that only, that only fits, I don't know, 60,000, all of them together. So guess what they do? They have small groups, thousands of small groups, that meet on a grid of Seoul, Korea. Small group here, 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 here. Small groups. And they train the small group leaders to multiply and grow. And then once every, I don't know, six months or a year, they all meet together in some big auditorium or something like that. Can you imagine a church of 700,000? But really, it's a church of 10. Multiplied by you know, 70,000. That's what it is. So this guy, his name is, at the time, Paul young Cho, now changed his name to David young Cho, um, got a visit from a Seventh-day Adventist seminarian who was doing research on church growth. And so the seminarian uh, pastor, uh, maybe he was a Korean pastor, I don't know, maybe he's from the area, he has a visit, and so he tells Pastor Paul young Cho, who's an evangelical church of some kind. Um, I am from Andrews University, and I'm doing a study on church growth, and I've come here to interview you and find out what your secrets are. He says, that's very interesting that you are a Seventh-day Adventist. Then he got up, left his office, and went to another side office, and came back with two books. One book was called Gospel Workers, and the other book was called Evangelism. Guess who wrote those books? L.N.G. White. And he gave those books to the uh, seminarian. He says, you want to know how I grew? I read those books 20 years ago from Ellen White. That's why we have 700,000 people in our church today. And I told that story to Tom Glatz. And Tom Glatz said, I know that's true because I went to school with that seminarian who went and, and did that interview with Pastor Paul young Cho. Well, I thought, huh, why can't we do that? Why can't we think about strategic small groups? Because, and I know that you're doing them. You talked to me about a few uh, groups that you have, and I saw in your bulletin you've got some of them there listed. I got the bulletin last night on the Internet. Why can't we do that? Why can't we be more strategic in how we uh, do small groups, you see? Why can't we use small groups for outreach, for blessing others, et cetera, et cetera? Just a thought, just a thought. Um, and so 
Now I want to give some understanding, if I can, again to understand the people that are emerging that we want to be able to reach. So I'm going to put on the screen pre-modern, modern, and postmodern. And how the words and letters come on the screen will illustrate the philosophy of it. Okay? Notice pre-modern came on the screen by words coming down from on high. Okay? Notice how modern comes on the screen. It's a box. You're on the inside. You're on the outside. There's lines that are very visible and very um, uh, articulate. Notice how postmodern comes on the screen. It's not even a box. It doesn't even fit in to whatever is not a box. The colors are all different. And there's not even a font that's the same. And, and the O is bigger than the capital P. It just doesn't make sense. It's like that screwy house. This is postmodernism. This is the world that is dominating our lives in the Kelowna area. Uh, so here's some examples. I'm going to, again, oversimplify. Depends what country you're in, what continent you're in. But uh, pre-modern times go up until the 1650s. 1650s till 1950s, let's say, 1980s, some people say, is the scientific times, you know, the modern times. And then the 1950s until today, postmodern times. Uh, so let's see if we can al uh, analyze this. Pre-moderns would believe in a higher power. All truth comes from on high. You don't reason it out. You just get told. Okay, pre-modern. Supernatural claims are true. In um, modern times... Uh, in pre-modern times, it was about the higher power. In modern times, about mind power. I think, therefore, I am. I can reason it out. I don't need the church to tell me what to do. I can use my own brain, thank you very much. And no supernatural claims are true. In the postmodern times, any power would work. And any one supernatural claim is as valid as any other supernatural claim. Okay, if you believe in Bugs Bunny can answer your prayers. It's just as valid as praying to Jesus and having him answer your prayers. Okay, that's postmodern. Okay. Um, next one. Truth is revealed in pre-modern times from an unseen source to authority figures. Post, uh, popes, priests, and kings, for example. And tradition reigned. Truth is uncovered in modern times, not revealed, and it's through the five senses and the scientific method. In postmodern times, truth is constructed, especially by the people who are in power, by local culture, and it's used to control. So if you feel that a truth is there to control you, then how are you going to respond to people who say, I've got the truth for you? This is a challenge that we at Venice have today. This is a challenge that we have. Um, now, next one. Any thoughts, by the way, on this? Does this make sense? I mean, are you beginning to think that maybe you know people like this? Pre-modern times, the belief in absolute and universal truths was there. In modern times, there is a belief in absolute and universal truths, but just different truths. But in postmodern times, they reject all of that. No absolutes whatsoever and no universal truths whatsoever and that's what I believed when I was younger. That's what I believed. As a matter of fact, you can imagine a, a wall. Let's just say the wall is a foundation upon which you build your beliefs. And that wall is there for pre-modern, for modern, but for post-moderns there is no such thing as a foundation upon which to build your beliefs. Therefore, you build your beliefs on your experiences. That's all that matters, okay? And you know very well the deception that can come when you build your belief on experiences. We know very well, as we study the Bible and, and the spirit of prophecy and eschatology, that experiences and miracles will be used by the devil to create deceptions in the last days, right? So we need to find a way to help people understand that there is a supernatural world out there and miracles aren't evidence of God only, but they're evidence of another power as well. We need to help people understand that. Um, 
And so, again, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. Pre-moderns were taught to obey authorities. Moderns were taught to defy authorities, especially the church, and any institution, and royalty. Uh, uh, and the reason why you have these pictures here, uh, does anyone know who that is? That guy with the beard? No, it's Galileo. Galileo, Galilee. Galilee, Galileo. Galileo, Galilee. Um, and, and he's the uh, typical uh, illustration of the uh, stupidity of church authority when it comes to uh, it was tradition. It was tr- tradition and church authority are all, all like the same thing back in those days. That the orbs in the sky were perfectly round and that the earth was the center of the universe because God put it there to be the center. And then Galileo comes along and uses a telescope. He uh, doesn't invent it, but he makes it better, turns it to the moon, and he notices there's craters on the moon imperfections. He recognizes along with uh, Copernicus that the earth is not the center and so he uh, says this and he gets put in jail by the ecclesiastical authorities for defying authority. He defied authority because his senses told him so. His reason told him so. His reason told him that what the Pope teaches, what the religious leaders teach, what the kings and queens teach is absolutely foolishness. And his reason told him that. And so you can now see an increase of, mo- of the modern mind over the pre-modern mind, using logic, using the scientific method. And so an, uh, an example of this, I looked it up to see if it's true and it's debatable. But I'll say it anyway, knowing th- that you have my little premise to it. It was an act of defiance to use the scientific method back in the 16 and 1700s, especially uh, 1600s. And a scientific method would be, if you want to know how many teeth are in the horse's mouth, what do you do? You count them. That's disobedience to authority. If authority told you already how many teeth are in the horse, horse's mouth, you don't need to count them. You just better believe and behave. But if you go and count them yourself, that is an act of defiance. And you could be put in jail for that. And they were. Now you can imagine that as the uh, scientific enlightenment kind of grew and grew and grew, it began to push down and make fun of uh, these uh, religious authorities who are telling you how many teeth were in the, house, the mouth of a horse, or even uh, that their spiders had six legs and not eight. This was supposedly a truth that was carried on for hundreds of years. But if you dared count, that meant that you were defying authority. Now, again, I may be exaggerating that. I looked it up, and I, and I see both sides on the Internet, on the, my research on that. But also, postmoderns defy authority as well. Okay? It's a way to be independent. It's a way to, uh, tomorrow, I'm not going to say this tomorrow, I'm going to say it now. Um, a rebel. A rebel is sometimes a wounded soul in disguise. A rebel may look like a rebel from the point of view of the authorities in charge. But from the point of view of some other uh, person, that rebel may be a freedom fighter, fighting for freedom against oppressors. The same person, seen as either a rebel or a freedom fighter. Same person. What's your perspective? When we, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, are attempting to be a blessing to the 200,000 people in the Kelowna area, we're going to view them as rebels, some of them as rebels. But please recognize that they're wounded souls in disguise. And rebellion is a symptom of their woundedness on the inside. So let not our pride be wounded by that. 
Let not us be offended by that. Let's just recognize that's human nature. We live in a world of sin. Sin hurts people. It makes people suffer and people get wounded and wounded people display symptoms. Sometimes those symptoms look like rebellion. Okay? So I, I think you, you get that. I think you understand that. Uh, so I won't say anything more uh, about that. But these are the people we're trying to reach. Uh, Jesus said, I send you as sheep among wolves. Wolves. So we're the sheep, and we get sent out to the wolves. Can you imagine trying to reach a wolf when you're a sheep? Imagine what that would be like. So here you are, a sheep. Hello, Mr. Wolf. I'm here to convert you. And what's Mr. Wolf going to say back to you? I'm here to eat you. <laughs> How do we evangelize a wolf when we're a sheep? Well, Jesus did give us a clue in the very same verse. I forget where it is. I think it's Matthew 10 or 11. It says, therefore, be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Emphasis on wise and harmless. And that word wise in the Greek is the same word for strategic. Hence, strategic planning. Right, strategic. So you, you better believe if you are a sheep and you have to be as harmless as a dove, you better be strategic because you're not going to do it any other way. All right, because a wolf is going to eat you whether you're a dove or a sheep. Right, so we need to be strategic and that's what Jesus says. And so to be strategic means knowing our target audience. Who are they? Where's their heart? What problems are they feeling? In the modern uh, world, in the modern era, objectivity was the goal. In the postmodern times, objectivity is thought to be an illusion. Authentic implementation of the scientific method is impossible, says the postmodern. When studying an object, the subject always gets in the way. Therefore, make the best of subjectivity. Uh, does that make sense? Maybe I should play that out a little bit more. Here's an example. A scientist wants to study your family dy dynamics. So he brings cameras into your home for a week. Every single room of your home, except the bathroom and the bedroom. And then after a week is up and observing your family interact with cameras on them the whole time, the scientist comes up with, wow, this family is very quiet. They talk very strangely to each other. Sometimes I can hardly even hear them. They're very strange people. What would you say to the conclusions of that scientist? Wouldn't you say the cameras changed the environment? Okay? This is a postmodern critique on modernism. That when you're studying something to be objective, the act of studying it intrudes on it and changes it. Therefore, your conclusions cannot be uh, trusted. All right? That's what postmoderns say about truth. You cannot trust the truth. Uh, no, not that way. You cannot trust when people tell you what the truth is because they're putting their own experiences onto it. And they're not admitting their own biases. So there's this critique that we have to deal with as Seventh-day Adventists. And in pre-modern times, objectivity was irrelevant. It didn't really matter what was, what was it, what wasn't it at all. Um, now, when it comes to doing evangelism, which we want to do in October, evangelism at one time was winning an argument. For sure. Somebody who is a baby builder, all they need to do is lose the argument to realize what the truth is, and then they change. I argued, and I lost. Therefore, the other person won the argument, and I need to change and become a Seventh-day Adventist. Or it's a sales pitch. Or it's preaching the love of Jesus. Now here, catch the difference between modern evangelism and postmodern evangelism. It's making a friend, not winning an argument. It's dialogue, not monologue. It's showing the love of Jesus as carried out in the Christian community and service. Um, when we have this, the Holy Spirit can be involved in many conversations that then lead 
to doctrinal truth being accepted. But we have to recognize that there are more minus eights, nines, and tens and fewer minus ones, twos, and threes. The minus one, twos, and threes, you could easily talk to them about doctrine and everything would be cool. It would be all right. They would, you win the argument and you got them. But not as easy anymore. We have to do more to reach them step by step. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Okay, what time is it? 8.30? Time to go. Uh, so we're going to go soon. Uh, back in pre-modern times, evangelism was simply joining the culture or winning the battle um, as we go along. Uh, I read this book for uh, my studies, uh, written by Russell Burrell, called The Life and Mission of the Local Church. And uh, he said this, If people are brought to a knowledge of salvation and truth, but are not brought into community, Christian mission has failed. See, the reason why the Methodist church under John Wesley was so successful is because he established small groups where he had truth being taught and fellowship being experienced. Together, together. It wasn't just a dissemination of truth from an expert to a peon. It was together learning and doing life together as we learn from the Word of God and applying the Word of God in, in daily life. Um, and now the last one. When it comes to the Bible, therefore, how is a postmodern going to approach the Bible? We're told in pre-modern times what the author or artist is trying to say. The priest will tell you. The king will tell you or the pope will tell you. You, you don't need to worry about it. I'm going to tell you what the truth is and don't need to study it for yourself. In modern times, we seek to understand what the artist is trying to say. In other words, emphasis on me using my brain to understand the Bible truth. The, the quintessential example of this is the way that William Miller learned and taught the, the uh, Advent message back in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, it's very logical very reasoned out. Uh, hermeneutical principles were there. And hermeneutical means uh, principles of, of interpretation. And so before, you're just told what it said. Now you've got to figure out what it says. And that's good. Ellen White talks all about that. But in, mo in postmodern times, the intent of the author or artist does not matter. What matters is, is how I interpret it from my own experience. It's like poetry. You experience poetry different than I experience poetry, and this is how uh, postmoderns think. Now, if that is the case, and it is the case in many, in many cases, what are we going to do, we Bible believers going to do, in order to teach Bible truth to people who don't have that kind of a view of scriptures? This is our challenge. This is our cha it can be met. Don't worry about that. It can be met by introducing them to an experience with Jesus, where the Bible is a tool, not an end in itself, uh, to bring them to Jesus. And so, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon. Do you like that picture? I just love that picture. It's a, I think it's a diamond, isn't it? It's a diamond. Imagine uh, Ellen White talked about the truth as gems of truth. Gems of truth. Okay, here's a gem. Let's just say that represents the truth. She says, precious, gems of truth. Imagine you heard about the $7 million diamond that was being brought to the museum. Is there a museum in Kelowna? There must be a museum somewhere. And, and so you go to the museum to see the diamond. And you pay your $25 ticket to get into the building and you're told where the diamond is and you look and you don't see it anywhere. So you ask the attendant, where's this special gem? gem? Oh, he says, I think it's kicking around somewhere in the corner. So, oh yeah, there it is over there in the corner gathering dust. Is that what you do for a diamond? You would not do that. What you would do is you would take the diamond and you would put it on a podium 
in the middle of a room and there's nothing else in the room except just that one podium. You put black velvet underneath and you put the diamond on the black velvet and then you shine lights on it and you put it encased in glass. And then you have lights all over the place shining on the diamond. That's what you do to that diamond. Isn't that not, is that not true? Now remember, the diamond is representing a doctrine, a gem of truth. You don't just throw doctrine around any old place. You have to set it in its context in order for it to shine and be valued. This is what we need to do with Bible doctrine. We need to put it in its context, the context of life. The context of, of a narrative of somebody having a problem and a particular truth helps them with that problem. For example, if A equals B, in other words, doctrines equal diamonds, and B equals C, in other words, the diamond needs a context, therefore A equals C, insert doctrine into a context, a picture, a narrative, or a life setting. As the Spirit of Prophecy said, we drop um, nuggets of truth into the setting of someone's life or story. It doesn't come all by itself. It comes attached to a, a life experience. So experience needs to be understood first, then you know what doctrine of truth to insert into it. Amen? Amen. Doesn't that make sense? This, this is truth right here, I'm telling you. So I'm going to end right there um, for now. So now built on this, I'm going to share with you tomorrow morning a little bit of my story about how I came from secular postmodernism to Adventism um, and, and build on that. And in the afternoon, some do's and don'ts, some more practical do's and don'ts, some experiments we tried and some things like that in the afternoon. And then I'm going to end with an appeal for you to pray for three people who are unchurched people so that you can bring them in October. Now, what we're going to do in October is not going to be a postmodern experience. It'll be a modern experience in that there's going to be a speaker speaking to an audience. So that's not postmodern. But that's what we Adventists are used to. So we're going to do the best to kind of bridge the two as best we can. We're going to have small groups. We're going to have other experiences to talk about. And we're going to be conscious of people going through one step after another. So that eventually they have both Jesus and the truth, and the truth with a capital T and the truth with a small t. Jesus and the doctrines together. All right? But in the context of a relationship. I'm going to close right now. And so come back tomorrow uh, morning and then in the afternoon as well. And uh, we'll continue on with uh, what God can do to help us to be a blessing to our neighbors. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for a little bit more understanding of the people for whom you died. The people who are so far away from you. So Lord, help us to understand. So that like it says there in Proverbs, that good understanding gains favor. And Lord, we want to find favor with you and with them. So help us to have good understanding that we can then be a blessing just like you called Abraham and his many, many, many great, great, great grandchildren to be a blessing to the world. That's never changed. You still called us to be a blessing to the world. So Lord, help us to be that blessing tonight, tomorrow, this week, and this year. Thank you, dear Lord, for your Son and our Savior Jesus. Amen. May God bless you. God loves you lots.